Biobalance HealthCast, episode 172, The Secret Female Hormone. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome to the Biobalance HealthCast. We are very excited today. We're going to spend our time talking about something that we've been doing for the last two years. For, or, or actually a little bit, more. slightly more yeah. than the last mm-hmm. two years. But Kathy and I have been writing a book about her practice and her work. Uh, and it's, it's available. It's coming out uh, March the 3rd in six countries. Uh, India, uh, South Africa, mm-hmm. Australia, Canada, England, England. and Great the United Britain. States. Mm-hmm. Great Britain and, and the United States. Mm-hmm. And the, the red version is the North American version, and the white version is the European uh, and Indian version. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a different cover because they have different cover information that would tie more to people who are British or the British Commonwealth. All right. So why do we write this book? My patients asked me to. I mean, years ago, maybe five or... In response to popular demand. Yeah. My patients kept coming in, well, why don't you have all these handouts? You tell me all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I can't find it anywhere except in medical journals, and then I don't get it. Or don't so, understand them. Because that's what I mean. I can't understand what they're saying. Get, yes. So they said, why don't you translate the data that you have learned, collated, and figured out on how to treat us mm-hmm. and write a book. So put it, put it together in one concise package. That and that covers. sounded like such an easy, straightforward deal at the time yeah. that I was waiting until I wasn't so tired from delivering babies. And, mm-hmm. and I actually, because I did try to do this years ago, and, and I kept like falling asleep while I was writing because I was so sleep deprived. But then things happened and I was and and fate intervened and then I could no longer or did no longer deliver babies and I took all of my time and spent it on patients and their hormones. Mm-hmm. So that gave me time I could schedule out for us to write. And you know and you know you know that. I do so know that. Yes. so that we would have I mean this is what it takes. It takes two to three years of dedicated time every week, maybe ten hours. Well, and, and it's fascinating. That's a lot of, of time. Part of the time is spent trying to determine what information you want to include. Mm-hmm. You know, what's the scope or spectrum of the book? What do you What do you need to leave out uh, mm-hmm. to narrow it down? And that was a problem for you. Uh, because <laughs> yeah. narrowing it down is always a problem for me. When you ask Kathy a factual question, factual slash medical question, mm-hmm. she just does a data dump. And she's constantly acquiring new information. She reads all these journals. If you watch our podcast, uh, basically, the way those come together is at least once a week, she sends me two or three articles that she's read in various medical journals or that somebody has come in and asked her a question about it. So she's done some research mm-hmm. and she says, read this and let's talk about it in our podcast next week. So I've gotten a pretty extensive medical education that you I have. didn't have mm-hmm. uh, over the last couple of years as we've done and the podcast. And then we have to translate them and into to, English because yeah, medical hopefully. journals aren't always written in English. No. I mean... Normal speaking English, they're written in doctorese. Right, in doctorese. Uh, jargon. Mm-hmm. And, you know, every profession has its own jargon. Mm-hmm. And so you have to learn to translate the jargon and read between the lines. And so we do that, and we were doing that in terms of writing this book. And so uh, in the beginning, we wanted to write a book that addressed the questions and the needs of the patient population that you serve. Mm-hmm. But you serve a very large patient population of both men and women. Right. And, and what we ultimately were advised to do was consolidate our focus down to a dimension of your population. Right. We had to take, we had, we had binders and binders and binders. Binders of women. No, binders of articles. That was (laughs) binders of articles for all, for all of the different symptoms, the different illnesses that you get if you don't get testosterone, Mm -hmm. all of the information about just how important hormone replacement is anti-aging we have binders on everything and so those are all medical articles there are things that i've gleaned over the last five to ten years and put put together and organized so we would go to those binders while we were writing and we had the entire floor filled with articles tables filled with articles and we put them in piles of what we wanted to put in what chapter so initially it was a matter of bringing all the information together and then deciding what couldn't be in this book because then the book would be like a dictionary. I mean, it would be huge. So we had to bring it down to 300 pages and we had to find a focus. So my focus has always been, I started out treating women. I'm a gynecologist. My focus has always been 
taking care of women because there are a lot of different areas of medicine that take care of men. Mm -hmm. So I looked at all of the books out there and found that there was not one single book that I could find currently on testosterone in women. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think is so important. That's the missing piece. Well, in the, in the course of the research, you determined that you think there ought to be a diagnosis that doctors are taught about and that mm -hmm. is standardized called testosterone deficiency syndrome. Right. And it doesn't currently exist as a diagnosis. So part of what you do in the book is argue the case to say all this disparate and scattered information is out there. When mm -hmm. you pull it together, it, it jumps off the page. And it says, mm -hmm. wait a minute, this is a diagnosable condition. There are parameters, just like there are uh, if, you, if you get the ICD-9 uh, You have 10. to get a code book. Yeah. Doctors have to have a code book. It's, I think it's uh, begun by the government. And then they have a, a list of all of the diagnosis, uh, diagnoses that you could possibly have. Mm -hmm. And then all the treatments you could possibly have. And those are two different, two different books. It's another way to generate money, I guess, but it's also a way to simplify diagnoses. And it, it makes it hard if you have a diagnosis that's not in that book, and this is not in that book. Mm -hmm. There's andropause for men, which is lack of testosterone, and that's what they call that in men. But they, on TV, they call it low T, but it's andropause in the, in the code book. But for women, there's nothing. There's menopause. That's not loss of testosterone. There and, is, and yet women make testosterone and yes. lose testosterone. Right, but no one has brought it to a point where somebody has to recognize it. Right. And it's it's been a secret. So that's why we call our book The Secret Female Hormone. Well, and, and that's and in your medical training and personal experience with women in the years that you've been a physician, you have heard repeatedly and you've heard from women that they have heard repeatedly that once women are no longer available for childbearing, mm -hmm. then they don't need these hormones and they don't need a sex drive. Right, I right. Mean, I mean, why, that's, why would they need a sex drive if they're not trying to get pregnant? Believe it or not, that's the current OBGYN thought. Not, now, there are some outliers. There are some researchers in the OBGYN community that do research on, on sexual things and the, and the need for hormones, but many of them are only studying estrogen. Like, we don't even have testosterone when we have three times as much testosterone as estrogen or estradiol, young woman's estrogen, when we're young. But it goes down after 40. So they're studying the wrong thing. So the cultural paradigm seems to be that once you've stopped having babies as a female, mm -hmm. you should, you, you'll should get a little fatter, you'll get a little slower, you'll get a... So you can't should spend think, most of your sex. time in the kitchen where you're handy to cook if we need you to yeah, cook. Yeah, complete throwback to and, the 50s. And take care of your families. Beaver Cleaver's mom, you know. Junior yeah, even war. though we were professional women and we were changing the world, but why should that totally stands in the way of women changing the world? Right. We hit 45 and it's like, up oh, out to pasture, see you, you can't think anymore. And that does happen. <laughs> Patients come in and say, I can't I can't think anymore because right. I don't have my testosterone. Right. So I need it I need it well, back. They don't know that. They don't know that, but I do. I give it back to them and then they're back in the in the workforce mm -hmm. and they are changing the world. So mm -hmm. Why should half of the population after 40 be shut down and, and told we can't do it anymore right. or be divorced because we won't have sex anymore because we don't want to? Well, not only be divorced and, and not having sex because you don't want to. or I mean, it's such a gradual decline that a lot of women report they don't necessarily recognize that it's missing they until don't. they start to get complaints. You know, because right. you, now is the moment that you have, and you're living today with all the agenda items that you have to juggle and you are not cognizant of, well, you know what? It's been a month since I've wanted to have sex mm -hmm. uh, or two months. It's or, off your list. It's off your list. And, and you don't notice that. But I remember your, that. Then your partner comes along and says, well, whatever happened to uh, you know, sex? And you're like, I, I don't know. I'll put it on my list. You know? Yeah, but it right after it doing the work wash. Right after mopping the floor, doing the wash, and making sure the kids are. You know, it's totally different than are finished. with testosterone. Without testosterone, is a totally different brain pattern in terms of sex. You, yeah. it it was a. I believe that it was probably a natural thing for all men and women mm -hmm. to lose their testosterone and not have to think about sex because then they weren't really able to have sex. It wasn't as easy. Without testosterone, it makes it much more difficult to, to actually have an orgasm. So God's way of letting us walk into death, which would be by 50, mm -hmm. and then and not be so tormented. Well, because for so many centuries, the life expectancy 
was 35, 40, 45, For women 50. especially, because most of us died in childbirth. 50% right. childbirth death, yeah. which when you want to think about your OBGYN, you should think about the fact that there's only four deaths in Missouri a year. In childbirth. I mean, in childbirth. So wow. that's unbelievable. Yes. I, I mean, totally unbelievable that we have gone from a 50% death rate yeah. to now having... Four, Four and I don't know how I don't know what exactly what the, the population is in Missouri right. at this point, but but that's a huge deal. And four is even a high number. Sometimes it's two, but that's what medicine has done for us in terms of staying alive. But that gives our lifespan a longer lifespan, and it decreases our health span. Our health span is only as long as our hormones are there, generally for right. the population. But, and that means we're not healthy that whole time. We spend a lot of our years without hormones being unhealthy. Well, so, so part of the focus of the book then is about making the case that women naturally generate these hormones and naturally need them. Mm-hmm. And that as they age and those hormones begin to decline, women ought to have an opportunity to have them replaced in the same way that, that men have that opportunity. Right. It's big business now. And that's why you see it on TV. Well, it's big business for men. It, it's Low T. Another factor in the focus of the book is is the factor of arguing against the regulation domination of what doctors can do by the FDA. Right. Uh, it's, it's a which is you can male do this, dominated, you can't do this. male focus. All the the the, the one uh, sanctioned use of testosterone by the FDA as a prescription drug for a defined illness refers to men. Men and and. Erectile dysfunction and sex drive and fatigue and loss of muscle mass. All the things that we get, too. Because but men they drive won't, the marketplace? Men men own the company still. Because as long as we start checking out at 45 or 50, mm-hmm. they still they will forever. Mm-hmm. They get test, You guys get testosterone longer. Well, I was going to say, we lag behind you in terms of loss uh, right. uh, by about 10 but, years. Yes. So it's still driving us as a concern. I'm noticing a decline in my desire, my functionality, mm-hmm. my ability to have or maintain an erection, get an orgasm, whatever. And there's something wrong with that. I want to do something about it. You know, doctor, what can you right. give me? Right, right. But and still, most doctors don't think about that. Taking for women. care of men are men, and right. mo- and half the doctors taking care of women as OBGYNs are men. However, women are still trained by men. Right. I wasn't trained about testosterone. I wasn't. Tr- I wasn't given that information. Right. I had to find it. And I had to be treated first and then be trained by the person who treated me. So I had to get that knowledge from somewhere besides my residency program. Right. So one of the big, bigger problems that we talk about is that the OBGYN community is mostly interested in women until we're done having babies. Right. Just like everybody else. Can't have babies anymore. See ya. We don't want to give hormones. Even when hormones were taken in 2001 when we had the WHI study, it came out Hormones are bad, so everybody, all OBGYNs replacing hormones, replacing hormones are bad. Yeah, and all it'll the OBGYNs and kill you. Don't do it. said, "I'm not doing that anymore." Right. Well, then it came out with a retraction and said, "Oh, we we our headline wasn't right. Mm-hmm. It was about Prem Pro, which is Provera, and Provera is the problem, mm-hmm. not the Premarin, which is the estrogen." So they didn't even look at testosterone, but they looked at these two hormones, and a headline changed everything, which right. was crazy. So all these thousands of studies that came before that said estrogen, they didn't even look before at Before and after. At, yeah, before and after right. said estrogen keeps your brain active. Estrogen decreases your risk of heart disease. Estrogen decreases your risk of Alzheimer's. Estrogen re- decreases your risk of osteoporosis and aging. All of those things, vaginal dryness, comfortable sex, all of these things were, oh, you don't need any of that. None of that's important anymore. Mm-hmm. So... That's what we're fighting against. We're fighting against. We're trying to use information. It's a huge cultural to educate mindset and bias, a, a distortion, a distorted bias that we're now trying to correct by providing accurate and up to date information. To I say, mean, every woman should read this book, even if it is, even if they don't intend on taking hormones, mm-hmm. just so they know what's happening to them and they know what the bigger picture is in terms of governmental agencies. I mean, we're paying half the taxes. Right. 
we should be getting half of the interest of the FDA. I mean, really. And the drug companies have brought different medications with testosterone for women to them, spent millions of dollars, and then they've given up because the FDA always says, oh, that causes facial hair growth. Big deal, get waxed, you know? Mm -hmm. We wax everything else, wax your face. That's, I mean, that's a nothing. That's a $12 deal, you know? A, a facial Brazilian. <laughs> yeah. No. No. <laughs> Oh my gosh, uh, but that's but I did bring that up. It's my fault. So, but waxing is nothing. I mean, it's not a big deal. So there if you also get are medicines. I mean, hair, if you don't want to do waxing. There's there are medicines that you right. can give to balance very low the risk positive medications. Positive effect of the testosterone against the negative. Spironolactone's the most common, and mm -hmm. it actually lowers blood pressure a little bit. It gets rid of some of the salt that's in your body, so it's not bad for you. In fact, many people think that spironolactone is makes you lower risk for heart disease mm -hmm. just because it suppresses some of the adrenal hormones, mm -hmm. but it works at the skin level to decrease facial hair. So right. we can use a very simple thing to stop facial hair, and it doesn't even require waxing. But this is something they don't consider. They consider that a big deal, or they just don't want us to have it. Maybe it's competition. Maybe it's a battle between the sexes we don't even know about. I guess that's very... Or, that, that, or, that's very kind of out there. Or the there. pharmacies, the, the medical manufacturers who can't patent and own oh, yeah. this product, therefore there's no economic incentive for them to pursue right. an FDA approval. They can patent the delivery system. Right. So when they brought testosterone out in a patch, mm -hmm. three, years of test, three years of testing, trying to get through the FDA, tons of research, proved everything except it might give you some facial hair. Now, mm -hmm. I don't think the dosage was high enough, I don't think, but... Having said that, it was better than nothing, and it was turned down by the FDA. Well, how many companies are going to dump that kind of money into a, a drug for us that has to do with testosterone, right. the delivery system of testosterone, and then walk away and say, well, we're down blah, 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 millions. Right. I mean, it costs a lot. It costs a lot of money. And that's another thing that's FDA made, made FDA regulations is how much it costs to bring a drug about. Right. So what, what's the same issue with like Viagra? Viagra uh, took three months. For three men, months for to men. get approval for yeah. men, but three months, three they're not years. doing research to find a similar drug, or they're not doing as much research, research aggressively to find a similar drug for women. No, they to can, they won't facilitate even do their sex drive. The private sector can't because it costs too much to know that you're going to get turned down at the FDA level, right. and then the FDA makes un un economic decisions about what the private sector can do. And they say they're trying to be safe, but honestly, testosterone saves us so many illnesses. There, you know, this would actually save us many drugs that we will use in the future. So, so we wrote this book to develop a, a rationale for TDS, testosterone deficiency mm -hmm. syndrome, to look at the reality of women not being attended to as uh, vigorously or as readily as they should be, to look at the cultural biases of male-dominated businesses and the FDA. We also wrote the book to look at, and, and I think this is significant, uh, to develop a, uh, a risk-benefit comparison for all of the different illnesses that if you don't replace your hormones, you can get. Mm -hmm. Anxiety, depression, osteoporosis, Alzheimer's. Uh, Sarcopenia, loss of your muscles. Uh, I mean, which weight means problems. I mean, inability so to things. take care of yourself. But we spend millions and millions and millions of dollars personally and through our insurance companies mm -hmm. to treat those individual things, which if mm -hmm. you got your testosterone replaced, mm -hmm. you there's a very high indication that you'd never develop those things. Yeah. Or if you did start to develop them, they would be delayed and less impactful. And if you, if you use testosterone, the risk of the risks that everyone attributes to estrogen don't don't apply at all. Even the imaginary risks that apply apply to estrogen don't apply to testosterone. So some women can just take it by itself. And especially the big casino. Everybody hears cancer. They're worried. By, cancer is a death sentence. Cancer is not a death sentence. No. Not automatically a death sentence. Mm -hmm. uh, Eighty-six percent of the people that get cancer live more than five years mm -hmm. uh, of, all, of all kinds of Of all cancer. kinds of cancers. So... Breast, breast cancer is in there, too. That's It's comparable. I mean, and the what did we say that the 10-year ten ten year survival was like 70-something percent? 75 percent. Mm -hmm. 
So, uh, I mean, five 10 years. years. survival is like 84.6%. 10-year survival is 75%. 20-year survival is 65%. But you can die of something Other else. Other people diagnosed with breast cancer. Yeah. yeah. But you don't get, that is not a death from breast cancer. That's just a death. Right. Yeah, we you don't, don't have to die of breast cancer. It's a it's any kind of death for any reason. So that always goes up as we get older anyway. But but it's important to point out that there is no research that uh, concludes that testosterone replacement causes breast cancer. That's true. That's uh, true. And testosterone in many studies, sh people who take testosterone alone or testosterone with estradiol have a lower risk of breast cancer that and I don't mean risk meaning you're never going to get it mm -hmm. I mean it's going to be delayed if you were you if you were going to get it it'll be delayed or it will be less severe yeah. but you could still get breast cancer if you take these hormones it's just that you would have gotten it anyway right that's the idea so so, so at the end of the day there, there's much much more in the book that we could we could talk mm -hmm. about endlessly uh, but if you are interested if you or listening to us today and, and you've heard these things and you've said, well, no, wait a minute. You know, I'm 45 years old. I'm suddenly fighting a waistline that I never had to fight before. That I, I can't, can't sleep. I can't enough, talk exercise about that. enough. Yeah, I can't sleep. I'm having hot flashes. I don't can't want think, sex. Can't think, can't recall words. <laughs> then maybe you ought to look at this book and having read this book, have a conversation with your doctor about the possibility of hormone replacement. You can go to uh, thesecretfemalehormone.com and get ordering information. There are many ways to order this book. It's going to be available electronically through all the major electronic distributors. Mm -hmm. It's going to be available in hard copies through bookstores and online. If you go to the secretfemalehormone.com now, you can pre-order uh, your copy of the book, and they will become available to the general public March 3rd of this year. So we would encourage you to do that. We hope that the, um, the request of our patients actually makes them very happy when they read it because it answers all the questions that I can't answer in an hour in my office. Mm -hmm. And they can then, most of my patients have said, I want to share this with my mother, sister, daughter. daughter. You know, I want, I want to give this book to my Girlfriend, friends. Girlfriend, wife. I right. Mean, I, a lot of men who become aware of this information want to go home and hold it up in their wife and say, <laughs> yeah, read well, this. I don't yeah. advise hitting anyone over the head with the book, but no. but it's it's always it's always a good idea to share Not with the information. Book, but with the information that's in the book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a man's perspective. Yeah. Offer it to your wife. Let it sit there for a while. See if it'll she'll read it. Because, I mean, it's kind of, it should be something she wants to know about. Yeah. It, it's to make us more free and more and more um, on a stable playing field with the guys. Mm. So that we can, we can live out our lives in health. It's not just for, it's not just for men anymore. All right. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.